advertised the league by broadcasting games. Using a TV production company, he bankrolled with borrowed money. But how could Monas, whose far more was hemorrhaging money, think he could make a pro sports league fly? These were people, you know, who uh, had extreme confidence in their ability. And, and it was just kind of a foregone conclusion that and if we're going to create a new basketball league from scratch and we're going to make money on it when no one else has, well, hey, we're the people who started Farmore. We can do, do these kind of things. But in reality, things at Farmore were a mess. Even with the exclusivity money, the company was still facing a $12 million loss, and the auditors were coming. So how do you make a $12 million loss disappear? Well, you can start by dividing it up into smaller amounts. $12 million divided by 129 stores comes out to $93,023 and about 25 cents a store. So you put that on the expense side of each store's ledger. And to make it balance, you need to add $93,023 and about 25 cents to each store's assets. Now, you can't claim cash you haven't got. Any auditor can see through that. But you can claim another category of assets. Your inventory is worth more than it actually is. And that's the first thing they did. So Farmore claimed every six pack of Coke in the store was worth, say, $2.30, when in reality it may have sold for a buck ninety-eight. Multiply that difference by thousands of six packs of Coke in 129 stores, and you're on your way to a $12 million cover-up. It's a whole new world facing today's chief executive. Competition is fierce. But how could Farmore's respected auditors, Coopers and Librand, who sell themselves on their know-how, be so easily fooled? Especially since a good auditor checks the inventory while it's physically counted. Now, you can't check all the inventory in every store. Moreover, Coopers, having won the Farmer account with a very low bid, wanted to limit its costs. So Coopers checked only four stores out of 129. And get this, Farmer found out from Coopers which locations would be checked months in advance. So when Coopers arrived to examine the stores, it's not too surprising that everything appeared to be in order. We went to Coopers and Librand to ask them why they were unable to uncover the fraud. An accountant is a watchdog, but not a bloodhound. Uh, an accountant cannot be expected uh, to fi search out and find every piece of fraud. Uh, it's, there's, a, there's really a big difference between being a bloodhound and a watchdog, and I think that's an important distinction. But perhaps a fair question is not whether Coopers was hired as a bloodhound, but whether the watchdog was asleep. With only a tiny sample to go by, Coopers accepted Farmore's inflated inventory figures year after year, even though Finn couldn't back them up with documents. In the end, the auditors not only bought Farmore's numbers, but declared that the company had actually earned a record profit in 1989. For the next two years, Farmore grew, and by all appearances, it continued to prosper. <laughs> to the folks back home, Mickey Monas had become a legend who breathed new life into their old town. He just produced jobs for everybody. You know, not just the jobs around Youngstown, but around the country because every time they opened a store they hired more people. Kim's Cafe was where far more executives came to celebrate their victories. Monas, the local boy made good, would occasionally stop by to serve as celebrity bartender. All the girls from upstairs uh, requested, I forget the title of the song, but um, it went, uh, Mickey, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow our mind. And, uh, They'd be singing it over there, and then they'd be all pointing over this way at the bar. And, it, and then it got the whole dining room singing the song. Despite monumental losses, Monas played on, as if nothing were wrong. He'd apparently convinced himself that Farmore was destined for glory, 
and with salary and bonus of half a million dollars, he lived accordingly. In addition, he took another half million dollars to add a room to his house. to pay off a rather generous visa balance to pick up an engagement ring for his new fiance. Monas developed an attachment to posh West Palm Beach where his second marriage took place poolside at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. The bride wore gold an 18 karat gold mesh gown donated for the day by a vendor Absolute Vodka it was worth more than half a million dollars and came complete with two armed guards. Monas loved the high life, loved to be where the action was. It would be three o'clock in the afternoon and they'd say, let's go to Vegas and we're going now. Just, just take your wallet and let's go. And we would fly into Las Vegas and there would be a limo from Caesar's Palace that would meet the plane on the tarmac. And we would get taken to, the, uh, to Caesar's Palace, and, and there would be a suite for Mickey 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It did not matter when we came there. There was always a suite. Monas was at home in the world of big bets and make-believe. He even built three stores in Las Vegas. And then there was the nightlife. Life was a game. Life was just this ride you're on. You know, you're working hard, you've got all this money, you know, coming through your hand, whether you own it or not, you know, that's for someone else to decide, but you have the power, the ability to do anything. The gambling was insane. I mean, my coaches would come back and say, yeah, Mickey gave me $4,000 to gamble with last night and I lost it all. Monus's activities would eventually be scrutinized by bankruptcy examiner Jay Alex. The sense I have is like it was a boys club. It was like a big boys club is what it was. And they were having a great time and the company was growing and cash was flowing and there were no rules and restrictions and they were hot. But at Farmore back in 1990, they were beginning to feel a different sort of heat. Losses were now more than $45 million and growing, but Monas refused to raise prices or retreat. He just couldn't admit defeat. It's a flaw that he had. He just couldn't look himself in the mirror and say, hey, we made a mistake here. We gotta fix it and we gotta go on. To cover up the continuing losses, Pat Finn was now faxing falsified financial reports to the board of directors and to David Shapira every week. But in November of 1990, a secretary mistakenly faxed a report with the real numbers to Shapira. Here, in black and white, was a report which no CEO could ignore. While Shapiro was ultimately responsible for farm work, he'd long ago left day-to-day -day operations to Mickey Monas. When he saw these startling numbers, Shapiro summoned Pat Finn to his Pittsburgh offices. Pat Finn told David Shapiro that, you know, everything, uh, th those are just preliminary numbers. We have to make some adjustments to them. And once we make the adjustments to them, then they'll, they'll be okay. In the end, the CEO of Farmore failed to check the figures independently. He seems to have bought Pat Finn's excuse. Now remember, we're three years into the fraud. Is CEO David Shapiro really as gullible as he seems? Well, a cynic might say that considering Shapiro's huge personal stake, as a major shareholder in Farmore, he believed Finn because he wanted to. After all, he would put his money on Mickey Modus, just like Pat Finn, the people of Youngstown, the banks, vendors, and investors. But what none of them knew was just how bad a bet they'd made. The deficits continued to grow, and knowledge of the fraud was now about to extend to another member of the company. Stan Charlestein joined Farmore in 1990. He quickly rose to the position of controller, a job that placed him in charge of all cash disbursements. Well, I, I learned about the fraud almost two years after my joining the company. That's when John Anderson took me into his office and closed the door and told me that 
well, you're the controller for Farmore now, and, and you should be aware of this situation. And he pulled out a subledger schedule and uh, told me basically that the financial statements at the end of June 1991 were misstated by approximately $150 million. If anybody was likely to blow the whistle, it would seem to have been the newcomer, Stan Cheryldstein. But he didn't. He, too, was persuaded to toe the line. I felt that through exclusivity money, through perhaps raising the prices, I felt that there were some options at that point that Pat and Mickey had available to them to correct the situation. And that's why I stayed on with the company, and that's why I never told another soul. Uh, that coupled with uh, a fear that I, I believe I had at the time, that maybe if I did go over their heads, maybe some harm could come to myself. Physical harm? Physical harm. I would go back there. John Anderson had spent much of his four-year career inside the fraud. Charlestein was the closest thing he'd found to a moral compass. He was able to make a lot of sense of things and, you know, seem to to give opinions and, and seem to say that, no, this is not the way it should be. Uh, we should be doing things this way, or, uh, no, that is absolutely wrong. And um, he, he was in there actually trying to, to fight and trying to change things, and um, it just you know, was up against the brick wall. Hiding the fraud was becoming more and more of a problem. The company was frequently strapped for day-to-day -day cash. Bills went unpaid for months. We had cabinets stuffed with held checks at the company that had been generated out of the accounts payable system, but we couldn't mail them because if we mailed them, the checks would have bounced. So they kept accumulating and accumulating. By the spring of 1991, Farmer was holding back $155 million it owed to vendors. They retaliated by halting shipments to some stores. Shoppers began to notice an unusual sight empty shelves. An image at odds with far more TV ads which promised customers everything. That's power by far more continued to live in its dream world even though CEO and board member David Shapira knew about most of the held checks. Discover how far more's power buying gives you far more buying power. This is the kind of issue that would rise to a, a board level concern I would think in most companies when a company needs hundreds of millions of dollars more than it planned on uh, the question would have to be asked why. So what was more important to Shapira and the directors than pressing for explanations? Perhaps selling Farmore's stock. The prestigious New York investment